Hey, welcome back to Way of the Ranch and on today's very special episode we are going to start cutting up our plywood. How cool is that? I have been really excited about getting to this point in the build and today it happens. So stick around. Now before you start cutting up your plywood, you're going to want to have your dimensions and your cut plans ready to go so that you aren't making a ton of waste and have to go get another piece of plywood. And uh, it's $120 worth of cabinet grade plywood. You do not want to make a mistake. So get these things set up. If you don't have these, I did a previous video to this that you should go check out and it'll show you everything on how to design your very own custom virtual pinball cabinet as well as make your own cut plans and then print them off and bring them out into the shop. But once you've got your cut plans printed out, I would take a couple minutes and figure out where your cuts need to be and in which order. So your first cut so that you don't cut into another panel or another piece, second cuts, third cuts, etc. That way you don't mess up and you don't waste any space. Now the other thing that I would suggest is I would not lay this exactly out on your full 4x8 sheet of plywood and then attempt to cut it all out at once. And the reason why is as you make your cuts you might experience some problems such as tear out that you have to take another little cut to kind of clean it up or uh, your cut is not exactly perfectly square even though you tried your best and so you can lay up off of that fresh cut to make it square and then that piece is still salvaged. So let's go take out our plywood and start cutting this up. Last time when we were doing the arcade cabinet build we were in the wood shop and I showed you how to use all of these cool machines and cool equipment and I thought that'd be kind of a neat thing for you guys to be able to learn about but I did get a lot of comments saying that's a really nice wood shop I don't have any of that stuff so I guess I can't build your thing. So what I thought I would do for this build is kind of go the complete opposite and not use any of that fancy equipment, come into the shop here and just use some basic power tools and equipment that you can either buy cheaply or even just borrow for free. So let me show you what I think you need for this build. Starting with the absolute basics. If you have a corded drill and you have a jigsaw, you will be able to make a basic level virtual pinball cabinet. Something to drill holes and something to cut stuff out. Now, are these the necessarily the best tools for the best cabinet? No, but you can get the job done. These are very quite cheap to buy, and if you wanted, you could ask your friends. Someone's probably got one you can borrow. Now, if you're going to cut with a jigsaw, it doesn't cut exactly the straightest cuts. It can kind of wander on you. So a uh, hint with this is you're going to have a guide that you're going to clamp down to your material so that you can rest it against and try to help make straighter cuts. But this will get the job done. Now, to get a better virtual penball cabinet build, you're going to want to get one of these routers. And this is going to allow you to do the little slit for the T-molding. This is going to allow you to make some templates and router out your speaker holes and your DMD holes uh, so that you get a nicer finish. And you can even use these to copy panels in case you want to just copy the left and right sides of a cabinet. Uh, you can use that with a straight flush router bit and do that too. So this is not needed, but if you have this, this is going to make this cabinet look that much better and more professional. And this guy here, this is more luxury item. Uh, those of you who have watched my videos before, I absolutely hate sanding, but I realize that it is part of the woodworking procedure to make these projects absolutely pop. So if you do not want to hand sand, which is totally an option and it's practically free besides the paper, uh, you can get one of these palm sanders or an orbital sander and this will make the job a lot faster. Not necessarily better, but definitely easier on your fingers and less time sanding. So not a bad purchase for uh, just saving time and making this a more enjoyable experience. Now, because our cabinet has a lot of long straight cuts, a better cutting choice over the jigsaw would be one of these circular saws if you can get your hands on it. Now, this thing is going to make a faster cut, it's a cleaner cut and way straighter than the jigsaw. So this is what I'm going to be using to break out my stock. Now, with all those power tools I just mentioned, you should be able to do about 95% of your cabinet. However, there are some long skinny trim pieces and some of them have some angles on them and that's going to be downright dangerous to do with the circular saw or the jigsaw. So I do recommend that you get your hands on one of these portable table saws. Don't go and buy them. They can be six, seven, eight hundred dollars. Just see about renting them at one of the local big box hardware stores. Now, I also would not recommend breaking out a full four by eight sheet of plywood on one of these because these portable table saws are kind of a little bit not stable. They're great for small stuff, but horrible at the massive sheets of plywood. So just keep that in mind if you're going to use these. Now, because a bulk of the cutting in this project is going to be done with a circular saw, I thought it'd be a really good idea to just kind of quickly run through some of the safety with this power tool. So first off, any kind of power tools, you're going to be using safety glasses to protect your eyes. 
The other thing is cord safety. So because you have a cutter here, you could put this cord underneath or lay it in front of your path and accidentally cut into it. So that'd be a pretty bad thing to happen. The other thing is, as you are making these long straight cuts, you have to watch that there's enough play in this cord and it's not going to all of a sudden catch on the edge of the wood and stop it from moving. If that happens, you could have this kind of cock at an angle and kind of bind and that's not good. The other thing is it's got a guard on here. Don't take it off, make sure it's there, make sure it's working so that as you finish your cut, it snaps closed and protects you from getting cut. Now, before you take your cut, I would get it up to operating speed with this trigger here and before you start cutting. And while you are cutting, you have to watch that the cut or the kerf doesn't start to close up or the boards start to kind of pinch together on the blade. Otherwise, it's gonna have some pretty disastrous effects. So what you need to do is figure out some way of holding or making sure that board is gonna stay flat during the entire cut so that it doesn't kind of just fall together and start pinching on the blade. And I'm gonna give you a trick on how to prevent that at home. So not everybody's gonna have a big massive table at home that you can lay a full sheet of plywood on top and then start cutting it up. And then the second problem is the circular saw blade actually extends about a quarter inch past the material thickness. So now you're cutting into the table and nobody's gonna to wanna to do that. Now, the other option is you could make or get some saw horses, put them up, and when you put your sheet of plywood on top, you got a next issue is when you go to take your first cut, which is right down the middle, you're gonna have that plywood start to buckle, it's gonna pinch on the blade, and you're gonna have all kinds of issues. So here is the solution. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go down to your local hardware store, and you're gonna get some two feet wide by eight feet long, by inch and a half minimum, maybe two inch thick, high density foam insulation. Now it's usually pink, but at my case it was ended up being black, but I would stay away from the white stuff, that's the styrofoam. Now when you cut that, it just turns into snowflakes and makes a huge mess. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna lay these down on the ground and butt the edges against each other, and you're gonna apply a duct tape seam between the two, and it's gonna make it like a hinge. And the reason why you're doing that is when you are ready to cut, you can fold this right out and it is now a four foot by eight foot table that you can literally lay down on the ground if you don't have a big table to put it and uh, do your cuts. Now, the circular saw blade is gonna take a little cut into here but it's only a quarter of an inch so you'll be able to do a ton of cuts on here before this thing's absolutely destroyed. And the added benefit is this foam is gonna act like a backer to your cut so that you will have a little bit less tear out on the bottom as well. And then the best thing of it all, when you are all done with your work, you literally fold it up into half the size, and now you can find a smaller spot to store this for your very next cool project. Now, when you're cutting up your woodworking projects, you may have to deal with something called tear out. Now, tear out is the damage to the top surface of the material when you make a cut. And it's basically ripping off the wood fibers from the top layer because they are being unsupported and busting off. Now, if you are making some super high-end cabinetry project where you are not painting it, but just finishing it because you want to see the wood fibers, then um, that's not going to be acceptable. So there are some ways to limit that, and I'm going to show you how to do that. Now, for us, we are making a cabinet that we can wood fill and sand and paint, so you're not going to even see the damage and probably put vinyl top of that, so you're really not going to see that damage. But if you are doing a solid wood cabinet and want to see this, then you're going to definitely have to deal with that. So these are the steps to prevent tear out. So first thing to prevent tear out is knowing where the grain direction is going. So if you are cutting with the grain, that's called ripping, that generally doesn't cause a lot of tear out. But if you're going across the grain, that's called cross cutting, that's going to give you a way more issues with tear out. Now one of the things to prevent or minimize the amount of tear out is make sure that you have a good blade that is good for cross cutting, not just ripping. The next trick is to use masking tape. So lay out where you want your cut to be, put a strip of the masking tape on top, and the masking tape will hold those wood fibers on the top and kind of give them the support they need so they don't tear out. Make your cut, and when you're done, you just peel the tape off and there will be no tear out. Next trick is to use a box cutter or a very sharp knife, and once you have laid out your line, very accurately score or lightly cut through the top fibers on your laid out line. And that way, when you go to use the saw, the edges of the blade will try to flick the wood fibers up, but they will stop breaking up to where you made your cut line. Finally, one of the best tips I can give you to reduce tear out is to support the top and the bottom of your material when you are cutting it. Now, if we were talking about a table saw, I would be showing you how to do a zero clearance 
table saw insert so that way there is no space next to the blade for the fibers to get pushed down and broken off as you were cutting. Now for us, I talked about that foam, we're going to use that on the underside to support the material so that should reduce the tear out there. But on the top, I'm gonna to be doing something different, so let me show you that. Now what you're looking at here is a Craig track saw. Now what's cool about this is that once you get it all set up, you can put your circular saw on top of here and this will help you make dead perfect straight cuts, which is really quite cool. Now the added benefit is that when you set this up, you actually take a light little cut through this plastic edge. And once you've done that first cut, you now have an accurate exact spot where this is going to be cutting so you can use this to perfectly line up with your layout lines and get really quite precise cuts. Now the added benefit again with a track saw like this is the underside here has kind of like an anti-skid material so it won't slide around and it stays put. Um, but this surface is going to be supporting right up to our cut and that's going to prevent any tear out on that side. So pretty cool. Now depending on the track saw you're going to use, they're going to have different setups, but for me I'm using the Craig style. It's really quite easy. You take your circular saw and you put it onto the carriage here. Make sure these clamps are up and out of the way. Put it as far forward against the plastic lip as possible and position it this way so that the left side of your circular saw blade is just barely touching the plastic guide on the track. And then put these brackets in place and lock it in place. You can also put a little stop in here so that if you need to take this in and out it will be very relatively close to where it was the last time you used it. And the very first cut you take on your track saw will cut a teeny tiny amount off the edge, that blue plastic edge of the track saw, and once you have done that initial cut, the next cut you do will have a perfect ability to line up exactly where this is going to cut and so you can use that track saw to line up where your cut is off of your marks you've laid out. Don't forget before you make your first cut with the circular saw you have to actually extend the blade out the bottom of the carriage here the amount to get through the material. So we're cutting three quarter inch plywood so you got to add that plus about an eighth of an inch so that you're digging into the foam itself. And then don't forget to add some thickness for the actual track saw itself. So in my case, from the very bottom of this carriage, I had to measure out one inch and one eighth to the tip of this carbide tooth. And that'll get you the right distance. Now, if you don't know how to adjust this depth, right on the side here is a lever. You just have to lift this up to loosen it. And that allows you to change the depth whatever you want and then when you're done lock it down by putting that clamp down and go pretty hard on it you don't want this thing to be moving on you while you're cutting all right when you're ready to start laying out off your plans you're going to need some measuring equipment first one is a carpenter square even if you can just use this to check whether these pre-cut edges are square. If they're not square, I highly suggest laying out a very nice square edge, make a nice straight line and do a little cut off the end there so that you have some square measurements to start your measuring off. The other thing I'd recommend is a long straight flat edge. It doesn't have to actually have like the increments like a meter stick, just as long as you know it's long and straight. And then good tape measure and a nice sharp pencil so that you're not having variations in your line where it goes thicker and thinner. That way every single cut going forward will be the same when you line it up. And of course your plans. So my plan is I'm going to lay out the first cut and then we'll take a look at the cut and see how bad the tear out is. If there isn't any tear out then that might affect the way we go forward with this project. So let's lay this out. Once you've got your marks laid out, simply lay down your track saw, line them up with your marks, and then you're ready for your cut. Now that we've done a cut, let's take a look at this before we continue. So where the track saw is laying, you got the blue plastic on the left hand side, you can see there is absolutely no tear out because that blue plastic is holding the fibers down. However, on the right hand side, it is tear out city all the way down. Now, once again, this may or may not really matter to you because we're going to be putting wood filler and sanding and painting and you'll never see this. But if you want to have absolutely no tear out, 
You could put a strip of tape before you do this cut. That would help with the tear out. Or my probably other suggestion is just use the track saw on the other side and do another cut for the next piece over. Uh, because remember, in my cut plans, I have about half an inch of play in here. So there's plenty of room to make another cut and make a nice clean cut like we did here. And for those of you wondering if this track saw is nice and accurate, let's quickly throw a tape measure on here. Look at that, left edge, 51 and a half inches. It's bang on and it's bang on on the other side. So great tool for nice, straight, accurate cuts. All right, so for this long angled cut for the top of the side cabinet, it's the same exact cut at an angle that matches both cabinets. So why don't we try the masking tape trick plus the track saw and we'll take a look at the cut that way. All right, we've made the cut. Let's peel back the tape and see what it looks like. Look at that, four feet, no tear out on either side. So if you don't want to tear out, it's uh, what, a couple pennies of worth of tape. Makes a nice cut. <laughs> yeah! One finished piece. There you go, it's uh, getting there, it's getting there. A Couple more to go. But now that you got the idea, all you gotta do is take your time and use the tricks I've taught you to be able to minimize the tear out and uh, start cutting up your project. So let's get this all cut up so we can start putting it together. Okay, there's one sheet done, moving on to the next sheet. And you can see there's nothing really crazy hard about this. You just take your time, double check your measurements, make sure everything is good and safe as you go and uh, you'll get it all done in the So let's go on to the next one. Man, am I impressed how accurate this Craig track saw is. Well worth the purchase. So 
So now that all the panels are pretty much cut out, it's on to all the little fine details. So things like the cutout for our coin door, cutouts for our plungers, holes for our, our different buttons and flipper buttons and vent holes. So for you, start with something simple that if you screw up, it's not that big of a deal. So I'm gonna start with the back box. We've got a bunch of vent holes, get a practice at drilling before we start making the finer details in the front of the cab that everyone is gonna see. So let's go take a look. So for the back of the back box, we've got some vent holes here that we need to lay out and drill. So pretty simple, but we'll go through this. From the top down to the line that these are on is two inches. So we have to make a nice line over here. It's two inches. And there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these holes. So that means this one is right on the center. So we're gonna have to measure this and make ourselves a center line. And then the spacing is two and a half inches for each of these. So let's start laying this out. Now, really important is make sure that you are going the right way because this thing is not perfectly square. So if you look here, this one here, where the lines are supposed to be, is supposed to be 30 and a quarter, which is this way, but the other way is 30 inches. So watch you don't do that mistake. So we're gonna make a two inch mark here. Use a nice little crow's foot. And then if you've got a long enough square, you can line it up. If not, make another mark at two inches so you can use that one. And then line up your marks. And draw your line. This one didn't quite make it, so we're just going to connect the two here. There we go. So there's our two inch line. Now we need a center location for where that center hole is. So 30 and a quarter is going to be 15 and an eighth. So right there. And if you're not sure, you could always just flip it around and check and it should be 15th and an eighth there if it's centered. And it is. So just so we know that that's our center, we can make a little center mark here. And then on this guy, it's every two and a half inches from that. So two and a half inches, half and two is going to be five inches over. And then one, two and a half. So there's one, two, three, four holes, two and a half over, half and two over. And then one, two and a half for the last hole. And then we just make some marks. So we got a nice crosshair and we know exactly where these need to be. There you go, not much to it. You can see it's all looking good, it's centered. If you're not sure, double check with your tape measure. Now, before we start drilling these holes, we wanna make sure that the drill doesn't wander and put the hole elsewhere and kind of ruin the look for us. So get yourself a hammer and a center punch, and we're gonna make a little dent in the wood so that the drill will start and continue where we want it. So take your time, line it up. Do a pretty good hit. That way you don't have any issues with the drill wandering away. Perfect. Now as for drilling the holes themselves, you've got a couple options here. Uh, what I've got today here is a hole saw. These are very easy to use, uh, not a lot of effort needed for hand drills. Uh, the only downside with these is the puck, that what you drilled out actually gets stuck inside and you have to kind of work it out with a screwdriver to get that out. I'll show you that in a sec. And then you got Forstner bits. Um, these are really good, cut nice. However, they're a little bit kind of harder to push. So I do not recommend using these with a hand drill, especially something like inch and a half diameter. You're gonna have to put a ton of force and they might walk and move positions on you. So, but if you're using a drill press, uh, these are really good, especially if you clamp the material down. Now I don't have the other one here, but a spade drill, it's kind of like a flat drill and on the ends it's got kind of little tangs that do the cutting. I do not recommend those. Those tend to tear out plywood pretty bad, so don't use those ones. Uh, and I got another trick here to show you so we don't tear out the bottom when we break through the material. Now with this sheet of plywood, uh, I've got a table here that I don't really care about. So if I drill into it, it's not a big deal. However, I do have some scrap 5 8 MDF from the old cabinet build. If I put this underneath and another piece just to kind of make it level on the other side here. 
Then I have a sacrificial piece here that I can push down into and that will help prevent the backside from tearing out and uh, keep it looking nice. So I'm gonna do that. Now, because we're not using a drill press and we're using a hand drill, we really gotta make sure that when we drill this hole that it is 90 degrees this way and 90 degrees this way. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with some weird tapered hole. So watch that as you're drilling. All right, like I said before, there is a wooden puck trapped inside this hole saw that has been removed from here. So to get it out, there's these slots on the side. Just find some small flat screwdrivers, one on either end. And you just simply kind of lever it out. Sometimes it comes out easy. When you're trying to film for millions of people, it never comes out easy. There he goes right there. And once you got enough of it sticking out, you can just grab it, toss it in the garbage, and then continue on to the next hole. All right, let's flip this over and see what the backside looks like. Eee, we got a bunch of tear out. Now, it's not exactly the end of the world, just break it off. Put some fill, sand, and paint. You won't even notice it's gone. However, let's use this as a learning tool and figure out how we can stop that for other future holes that we don't want to have this happening. So one thing I noticed that this board was kind of lifting a little bit off my sacrificial piece near the end of the cut. So if it did that, then that's why it's tearing out as well. So I could prevent that by clamping this board down, making sure that they're solidly being backed and supported behind it. The other trick you can do is those hole saws have a little drill, a little quarter inch drill. You can drill to a certain depth so that that breaks through to the other side and start your cut here. And then when you get to the other side, you can flip it over and use that to perfectly locate where this is going and drill a little bit on the back side so it doesn't tear out, then flip it back over and then continue to drill through and that will prevent the tear out as well. So couple tricks to prevent this for your other future holes. Okay, moving on to the flipper and magnet save buttons on the sides of your cabinet. Oh yeah, take a look at this one, way better. Just a touch of tear out here, so that is a better trick. I'm gonna to try to clamp my stuff every time I go through this with a sacrificial piece on the back and that'll take care of that tear out. And to speed things up for you guys watching this video, do the same thing for the top of the cabinet and lay out and drill the big holes that are required in the bottom of the cabinet. So everyone's is gonna be a little different, so I didn't put it in my plans. But for me, I want two big air holes for the inlets, for the computer fans, and then I'm gonna put one big one right under where I'm gonna position the sub inside so that those low base notes can come out through the bottom of the cabinet. Now, pay attention to where you're laying those out and you gotta kind of forward plan a little bit where stuff is gonna be. I want these holes near the front of the cabinet, but I also have those one inch glue up blocks or battens that I'm gonna put around the edges. So I have to make sure that my hole is not getting obstructed by those. So just keep that in mind, figure out where stuff's going, put your holes in. I've heard a couple tips about drilling with these large hole saws. First off, make sure everything is together properly. There's nothing loose. Otherwise you're gonna have nothing but problems. Second thing is do not push down with this a ton of force. Let the saw do the work and have it spinning somewhat high speed. 
Now, these drills here are only air-cooled with the little fan here when this thing is spinning up quite high and probably too high for what this needs to run. So you have to slow it down, but at the same time, this thing's not getting cooled. So when you're doing multiple holes, I would take a break in between, make sure this thing doesn't overheat on you. And uh, the other thing is, look at how big this thing is, four and three quarter inches, and you're holding it here, you better have both hands on it holding it securely. If you're holding it with one hand, this thing could catch on you and break a wrist, so make sure you're holding it tight. Cool, moving on to the front of the cabinet, which is gonna start making this thing really look like a pinball cabinet. So I've got three drawings here. This one is more detailed for the actual coin door opening, which we need to lay out for four holes in the corners, and then we're gonna jigsaw that out. And then the other two drawings here are closer up details of the plunger and the launch ball. Uh, nothing really different here. We're just going to lay out and drill these four holes and then jigsaw cut out those corners. And on the launch ball, it's just a hole, but the back side needs a couple of um, blind holes, so holes that don't go through, just to locate the button so it says launch and it's not like upside down when you install it. And then this guy, for all our coin in and exit and enter a game buttons, uh, we've got another zoomed up drawing for the details. This one's a little bit different, so we need a little kind of counter bore. So we're gonna use a Forstner bit and go about 3 8 deep uh, with a 1 and 3 8 inch diameter Forstner bit, and then we're gonna finish it off with a whole saw and go through. So let's start laying this out. all laid out ready to be cut up and drilled according to the plans. Now take a second and re-measure things. Uh, it's way easier to erase a pencil line and redo that than trying to figure out how you're going to plug a hole in your cabinet. Now it's time to tackle these front buttons that are counterboard. So I've got an inch and three-eighths diameter Forstner bit. I'm going to make a mark with a tape measure and a Sharpie on here, three-eighths of an inch deep. So that way I have a reference of how deep this should be. Another way of doing that would be wrapping some tape. And all you do is just drill up to the line or the tape. Check your depth. If it's good, then just do the other two the same. And then when we're done that, we're just going to take the smaller drill, which I believe is inch. Could be inch and an eighth. I'll take a look at the drawing. And then we're going to drill those all the way through with a hole saw. Cool, all the holes are put into the front panel here and now we just have to use the jigsaw to cut out the coin door opening and the plunger detail. Now the way that jigsaw blade works where it goes up and down as you're cutting, it's probably gonna tear out pretty nasty on both sides. So I'm gonna do the, the tape trick and put it on both sides of the piece. And if there's a bit of tear out, it's not the end of the world. Remember we can sand and fill. And the other thing is the coin door is gonna have some overlap to hide that. Same thing with the plunger. So let's cut these out. A couple tips for you while you're using your jigsaw. I would always clamp down your material. That way you're not trying to hold that plus try to move this accurately. The other big tip is when you are done cutting, do not yank this out of the cut while it's still moving. Let go of the button, 
wait a couple seconds for it to stop moving back and forth and then take it out. That way you don't break the blade and make a mess of your cut. And uh, obviously just keep your fingers away from the blade, don't have your fingers underneath, and uh, go for your cuts. Wow, almost no tarot. That's pretty cool. We'll have to check the other side, but looks like no tarot. Wow, super impressed. Not a single bit of tarot on the backside either, so that tape method worked really good for that jigsaw. I guess just make sure you have a really sharp blade. Now, one last thing before we forget, we have a couple pulls for the back of that launch ball button. That way it orients properly and says launch the right way instead of it being upside down. Like a glove. Sweet. And don't forget to drill your holes for your coin door bolts. And don't forget to drill the hole for your pivot for your back box. Now, I have noticed a mistake in my design because when I laid out the dimension for this hole, when I line it up with the hole for the pivot, I'm actually about three eighths of an inch sticking up past. So that's not gonna let the back box sit down. So I had to take a look back and see what happened. Well, the dimension is okay from MGR Net. However, they are assuming that you are doing a rabbit joint for the top piece that sits in here on the side, and it's gonna be 3 eighths of an inch higher because of that. So, for you guys doing this at home, you could just add 3 eighths of an inch to this part where the top of the cabinet goes, or you can do what I'm gonna do, and I guess you're gonna see if this works, is I'm just gonna make the whole location 3 eighths of an inch down, and then that way when this sits down flush, that hole will be perfect. So the next thing is I have a bunch of little holes that kind of needed to be figured out before I started drilling them. So what I did is I literally laid out absolutely everything that's going in the cabinet so I can see where those holes are gonna be, make a broad mark and then kind of lay it out and drill it after. So let me show you what I did. Starting at the front of the cabinet, you can see I've got the front base shaker for the front channel all the way up to the front, so I'll feel the front channel better. I've got my two inlet fans placed over the holes we've already drilled. And then in order to get this base shaker as far forward as possible to tell that the difference between front and back, I decided I'm going to make a little kind of elevated tray to hold all of the audio stuff. So uh, this is actually removable and it's the wireless control for the 2.1 sound setup. So this can go anywhere I want, including off the cabinet. And then I've got my front and rear uh, amplifiers, got my 7.1 uh, surround sound external card. And then this is that KLZ25 board. Uh, I just left it in the st electrostatic package so I don't zap it. Uh, so with that all elevated, I can get this base shaker nicely up to the front. Now, right behind there, I've got the sub. So I'm gonna have to drill a hole for the sub. So the base notes get down through the bottom of the cabinet, but that's roughly where uh, I'm gonna put it. Got a little teeny fan controller board that can really go anywhere. Uh, but you can see there is quite a bit of room, especially if I wanna do any kind of future upgrades. Right here, somewhere on the right near the front, I'm gonna put underneath the cab uh, a soft power on off button so I can shut the, the cabinet off. And then once again, I've got some small teensy and an octo shield for the LED addressable lighting and the DOF setup. So this is pretty small. I might even try to put it on the shelf as well, but uh, really that can fit just about anywhere. Now, what I've done on the back is I've got the computer here. It almost fits stood right up. And uh, the question is, do you decase it completely or not? I might just leave it like this if there's room. Uh, if I need room, I'll take it apart and make a smaller board for it. But 
I wanted to have the rear bass shaker as far back as possible so that you can hear a better distinction between the front and cha uh, back channels. So I am going to make a kind of shelving unit for this to sit on and I think it's going to actually be on drawers so I can pull it out once I open up the back hatch and that way you can service the PC. And then to the left and right, uh, there's our smart power strip for power coming in the cab and then our various power supplies. So one for the LED addressable strip, one for the 12 volt stuff and if I need more, I still have some room on either side. So really this is about it. Oh, I forgot one thing. On each of the corners, I'm gonna drill like a half inch hole away from the glue blocks so that I can run the LED addressable strip underneath the bottom of the cab for under cab lighting. So I've got a hole to lay holes, four holes for these to lay out. I've got a bigger hole, probably a four and three quarter inch diameter hole saw for the sub because the speaker is on the bottom. One for the power. Ooh, and I, I almost forgot the one thing here. So I want to put one of these USB pass-through sockets right up at the front, but underneath. That way, when you're looking at the front of the cabinet, you don't have extra holes and buttons and things that would not be there. Yet, you can just quickly put a USB key in or a uh, controller, game controller, if you wanted, so that we can play some main games pretty easy uh, underneath and out of view. And then, this is the coin door. I'm just kind of loosely put this up in the front so you can actually see. If you were to open up the coin door, you can see inside. And uh, once again, this elevated uh, shelf will make it easy for me to make adjustments on the amplifiers. Uh, and that's really all the access I would need for that. So, cool. I'll lay this all out and start drilling those holes. Moving on to the speaker panel, I have to drill some holes in the kitty corners with the hole saw just to get the jigsaw in here. And then I'm gonna cut out the openings for the DMD and the two speakers. And when I do that, I'm gonna stay about a 16th of away from the edge to the inside. That way I leave a little bit of room to clean up with a router after.
finish up this back cabinet, we have to cut out our access door that's going to be on a hinge. Now you can totally just do what I just showed you, drill some holes with the hole saws and cut it out with a jigsaw. But the problem is the piece you need is going to be damaged because you had to put the holes in it. So what do you do? Well, I've got a new trick I'm going to show you. It's called plunge cutting and it's doing that with your jigsaw so you don't have to have any holes. Now, if we can do that without any holes, we can salvage this piece. And I'll also show you another trick so that we can pre-install the hinge. And when we make the last cut, the door is absolutely perfect. Now for a plunge cut, you're gonna put it kind of on its end like this with the teeth facing down. You're gonna get the blade started. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna start kind of tipping this jigsaw into the material slowly. And as soon as it starts cutting, you're gonna to start to go forward with it a little bit to help it kind of clear the cut as you continue to turn and then eventually you get it down right into the cut. Now a couple things, because we don't wanna to have to scrap the piece inside, on the top I am trying to line up this blade exactly on the cut and try to make sure it's not crooked, that way I have a good cut. So let's give it a try and I highly recommend that you practice this on some scrap pieces before you do yours. Now taking a look at the cut I just did, you can see a slight wave in it, but man, by the time you get the door on hinges, you're not gonna notice this at all. So as far as I'm concerned, that's a good success. We just have to do a couple plunge cuts and we will get that back box done properly. Yes, this looks nice and straight, so that's awesome. I'm gonna continue with this. Now, special note, don't go all the way to the corners quite yet because we're gonna mount the hinges before we do the final cut to release the door. This bottom cut, I'm gonna cut all the way to the corners. That way I can pre-install the hinge and then just cut the rest and it'll free it up. For these hinges, cut on the seam between the two. Don't cut in the middle, otherwise it kind of butchers one. Okay, when you're installing your piano hinge, make sure that the split between the piano hinge is centered on the cut you just did between the two pieces. Make sure it's centered left and right. And then I would just lay out one of the holes first. Go ahead and center punch that drill a little pilot screw and then put in one screw and then do one on the other end and I would maybe put kind of four in here to kind of hold its position. Once you got four in, then you can go ahead and pre-drill and put in all the other screws. Now to figure out what size pilot drill you need, take the screw you're gonna use, put it behind it and see if you can still see the, the teeth of the thread sticking out on the left and right sides. That's a good pilot drill size. The other thing is I don't wanna drill the holes all the way through so I've put a little tape stop to make sure I don't go all the way through. All right, cool, there is one fully functioning access door with a nice even gap just because of the pre-installed hinge. Now, there was a couple oopsies. I have a little spot here where the jigsaw blade kind of hopped over, but that'll be a quick wood fill and sand and we won't see that. And uh, just for you guys, when I did cut this out, because the jigsaw blade had a very tiny kerf or the width of cut, it opened partly and I didn't want to open fully. So you can either try 
sanding it a little bit, or because we centered our holes in here the way I showed you, all you have to do is loosen these up, all of them, and then just pull down a bit on the door and retighten it. And that's all I needed to do. And this thing is just beautifully centered and uh, ready to go. All right, to finish off this back cabinet, I have laid out a hole for this IEC 320. And I just laid it out so it was symmetrical left and right and up and down, so it looks good. And we just gotta drill some holes and cut it out with a jigsaw, maybe a touch of filing if need be to get this to fit in nice. And then once that's done, we just need to put a tiny drill in there for a pilot uh, hole for the two screws to put it in. And then I think I'll save the door lock till this is kind of more assembled. Just like the back of the cabinet, I'm gonna do the same kind of plunge cuts with my jigsaw, pre-install a hinge so that we have an access panel on the back of the back box. Now, when you go to design yours, I didn't put any dimensions on my plans because it really depends on what kind of access you need or want. So you don't wanna make the side or the edges skinny, otherwise it kind of weakens this whole thing, kind of defeats the purpose. And if you make it too small of an access hole, then you really can't get at anything and it's kind of useless. So kind of, Lay out what you need and figure out what you want. Uh, for me, I ended up making this four inches uh, all the way around, and uh, that way it looks a little good with the way these vent holes are up here. So let me get this all cut out now too. All right, boys and girls, we are going to cut the video there, even though as much as I hate part one and two and three videos, uh, this one's gonna be probably at least a part two because of the length of detail that I need to give you guys. So you have all of the information you need to know to be able to put your own virtual pinball cabinet together. So stay tuned for part two, it'll be around the corner very quick. If you guys have any questions about what happened in the first part, just put them down in the comment section below and I will get back to you as soon as possible. And if you haven't already, why don't you join us on Instagram? That way you can see all the behind the scenes stuff before the videos even come out. Till next time, take it easy.